Before I start, I want to say a couple of thank yous and do a little warm up with you guys. But first of all, I'd like to thank my lovely mother, Vicki Ramsey. Especially over this last year with all my travels and even more this weekend, just preparing this presentation and helping me cook this amazing dinner back right here. If you ate it, I hope you enjoyed. Uh, I would also like to thank Sean LeBoy for advising me throughout this whole year and making the Guatemala trip happen. Yeah. And also all the people who, oh wait, the bakes are upstairs. That's okay. There'll be bakes after the presentation. Uh, I would like to thank everyone who cooked after school today, Cornel, Cole, Miranda, Myra, Elise, Milo, Mila, Jane, Gracie, and anyone else who helped cook. Thank you so much. Uh, I would like to thank All Hands and Hearts, the program I went to Dominica with. It really gave me a good idea of what an organization can do with hurricane relief and other disasters. And I would also like to thank Youth Initiative High School for supporting me this year in my project and also letting me be flexible with my time. And last but not least, everyone who donated to my project. I would be up here doing a totally different presentation if it wasn't for you. Thank you so much. And if you haven't donated yet, there are two jars in the back for you to <laughs> Really good causes. Please donate. Thank you so much. Okay, now we're gonna do a little warm up. So, can everyone do this clap? So this is how we go. I'm gonna say this is a little warm up we learned last Martin Luther King Day. So I'm gonna say good evening, and you guys can go. So let's try that. Good evening. Good evening. Okay, so we're going to do that twice, and then you guys are going to say good, E-V-E-N-I-N-G, good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good E-V-E-N-I-N-G, good evening. Our friend's brother, who just so happened lived in San Juan, Puerto Rico. 
So I spent my night. So I spent my night wandering the the, the city. Learning the history and talking about murals we passed with Susan artists. And Danny was the first person to sh like show me how I wanted to show up in the world. So, my arrival in Dominica was very timely. You had to be 18 to stay on the base, all hands and hearts base, and I arrived 12 hours after I turned 18. <laughs> <laughs> which put me in an interesting situation. I was used to being a high school student, which I still was, and being treated like one, and not knowing exactly what I was doing with my life and being supportive of that. But here I was, being treated like an adult and expected to know what I was doing, so it was a little bit of a change. <laughs> my life in Dominica was very much different than my life here in the sweet old town of Europa, Wisconsin. Um, <laughs> for two months, six, day, six days a week, eight hours a day, I helped build schools and homes. But every day felt like a vacation. It was because all the people around you loved what they were doing, and we were all there for the same reason. And don't get me wrong, the work was hard. It was physically demanding and mentally demanding, but anytime it was too hard, you had someone to your right to laugh with. So together, we poured our blood, sweat, and tears, and made it through the painful days. And now, one of my favorite work sites was, well, oh, that's Sandy. <laughs> One of my favorite work sites was Water Source. This is Water Source. Uh, we were making clean water more accessible to the more prosperous community. But it was also one of the hardest work sites. And the hardest days at Water Source were the concrete pour days. Since we didn't have a concrete mixer at the site, we had to transport concrete from the school site down to the water source, and then two buckets at a time, carry it down these steps. Oh. And at minimum, walk, you personally are walking up and down these steps around 15 times, which doesn't sound that hard, like you can walk up and down the steps, sure. But when you're carrying a 45 pound bucket in this hand, the 45 pound bucket in this hand, I was, I was kind of done at cool. <laughs> My favorite job, so every day it looked different, but for two months, six days a week, I ate the same thing every morning. I would wake up at about 6 and make a bowl of oatmeal. I would eat a banana. I would eat a banana peanut butter sandwich and two eggs. Every single day for two days. And then after I ate, I would get my work clothes on and we would all meet in the garage at 7.15 to head up to work. And then you started work at 7.30 and work ranged from masonry, masonry to carpentry work and digging in the mud to shoveling gravel and everything in between. But my favorite job was cooking lunch. <laughs> the, this is Deborah, and this is Priscilla, our two lunch cooks. We would help cut veggies, and cook soup, and bake chicken. But the reason I went there wasn't to just cook lunch. I wanted to listen to their stories of being in Hurricane Maria. Hurricane Maria hit Dominica as a, hurricane, as a Category 5 hurricane in September of 2017. And it damaged over 90% of the roofs and made 80% of the homes uninhabitable. Which, they were still living in them, but, so this is right after the hurricane. Yeah, so I listened to them and I got the, over the two months I was there, I got to know Deborah, Priscilla and their families. And they really just gave me a second home. And it was really hard for me to leave and I had to come back to the world well. But after work, and work would end at 4.30, you'd go back to base, and you know you take a shower, do whatever you needed to do, and then at 6, we'd have a staff volunteer meeting, and then at 7, you would eat dinner, and that was about the end of your day. And that was just every day for six days a week. You didn't... <laughs> so there wasn't much time to explore Dominica. You know, you had your 
one day off and we used it very wisely. Everyone would do a different adventure every day. Some people would keep it more chill and just head to the beach, you know. A, 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 others would be a little more adventurous and head to the boiling lake or go to a waterfall. But my favorite Sunday expedition was heading to Waving Sodique Falls, which was a waterfall that fell into the ocean. And so this morning we we drive to Rosalie, and we get to the, the trailhead, and we're a little bit skeptical because we got like we talked to five different people, and they all gave us different directions, and so we're walking down. About ten minutes, we get to a yurt, and we know we're in the same direction, the right direction now. Like any good story, an old man comes out of his yurt, and he gives us directions, <laughs> and, gives us directions and then warns us of how dangerous this hike is. When he said dangerous, he meant dangerous. This was the steepest hike I have ever been on. When I, say, when I say steep, I mean it was literally down the face of the cliff. I, this is a little confusing, but I am standing on a branch about halfway down the cliff, and these are all perpendicular, all these branches are perpendicular to the cliff face. And that's the ocean and rocks for me. <laughs> so it just rained and rained, and we're sliding down these muddy, slippery ropes, and at one point I'm on this rope ladder. And I just look down, and there's just nothing below me. It's just cliff, water, and rocks. And I'm like, okay. I don't know if I've ever had more fun in my life. I felt like a pirate exploring the jungle. You know, we went on many other adventures. Other days, you know, we swam out to sailboats and met French captains and hiked through the Valley of Desolation to the Boiling Lake. And yes, it's actually called the Valley of Desolation. <laughs> People have asked me if I went swimming in the boiling lake. It was actually boiling. I did not go swimming in it. <laughs> Some of my friends did exit it, though. So <laughs> Going into this trip, I was really excited. I've always wanted my life to be trip after trip after trip, plane to plane, but be careful what you wish for. At the end of my two months in Dominica, I was really homesick. I was missing my friends and my family, my community. Yeah. And I just want to give you a little idea of what my year was like traveling. So at the end of September, I took a college tour with my good friend Charlie Torres. <laughs> we were gone for about a week, and we went up the east coast and back through Canada and then back home. And about three weeks after that, I took a trip with my brother, my dad, uh, to surprise my grandma in Oregon for her birthday. This is us in the airport. And, but when I returned from that trip, I had about four days until I left in Dominica. And I was in Dominica for two months. This is... <laughs> uh, I was in Dominica for about two months, and when I got back, I thankfully had a couple of days in Europa. I had two days in Europa for before I left on my next trip. This is Christmas. I got to spend Christmas with my family. And then my mother, my brother, and I drove to New Jersey for New Year's Eve. We spent New Year's Eve with our family, stayed there for about a week, and then we came back to Europa. And I luckily had a good month until uh, the, our Spanish class went to Guatemala. Oh, yeah. This is us in Guatemala. Uh, um, and then, now I'm back. Now I'm here. <laughs> so, yeah, I left them. Although these stories aren't, although these trips aren't part of my senior project, going to Guatemala really had a stark contrast to my privilege. Really gave me an idea of what my privilege really is. Uh, I noticed that when I, when I went to Dominica, it had been a year since the hurricane, and people were still living in poverty. People were living without roofs, which is tarps over their houses. And I, I worked at a school that 40 children were going to school in, and it was just, the floor was just a puddle. There was holes in the tarp that they used as a roof. Luckily, we fixed it, but... Uh, yeah, I just noticed the, that they were still in poverty, but I also noticed the same thing in Guatemala. People were living with holes in the roofs and chimneys that just let smoke walk back in. <laughs> but I saw a difference between 
the poverty in Dominica and the poverty in Guatemala. The po poverty in Dominica was a little more temporary. You know, we saw people lives just switch around from just a little help from their friends. But in Guatemala, it was a little more. It was there. You, it, the solution wasn't just helping them fix a roof to get back on their feet. It was a more complicated problem. <clears throat> and over these several months, I realized that I can be the problem and also the answer. That we can all be the cause, but also have the potential to be the solution. <clears throat> Who drove a car here? <laughs> Who turned on a light today? Who flew in a plane this year? You know, these are all, all these privileges we have are the causes to storms like Hurricane Maria and islands like Dominica take the brunt of them, take the brunt of our privilege, all of our privilege. And this is what happens all over the world and not just with climate change. Like I said at the beginning of my presentation, Danny was just the first person to show me how I want to show up in the world. He opened his house and showed me that trust engenders trust. Deborah and Priscilla have a sister in the US that they would love to visit, but we have such closed borders that they can't. And they not only opened the borders of their country to me, they also opened the borders between our families. And Sean, Sean showed me that it's not just important, important to learn, memorize the facts and learn the history, that it's important to go see how people live, go live their life, go hear their stories, and get to, know, get to know the people that, you know, aren't living the same life as you, aren't living our sweet Baroque lifestyle. <laughs> My mom showed me that you need to push yourself out of your comfort zone to succeed. And I just want to end with a little a little quote. And I just want to say that I, I can only hope that I can show someone someday how they want to be, show up in the world. And I want to end with a little quote. We don't see things as they are. We see things as we are. And we can see a problem in the world, but we can also be the problem and see the problem in ourselves. So. Thank you so much. Before, before questions, uh, I was hiking through the Dunker Jungle trying to get to the Boiling Lake and we got lost. <laughs> and this is what we found in the middle of the jungle. This little sheep. And luckily, <laughs> this old man was just going out to collect his goats and found us in the front step. So that's just a little backstory to this one. <laughs> okay, questions? Yes? How many hours do you think you spent working in the Um, It was like 360, almost to 400 hours. Who said that quote? Who said that quote? Oh, it was. Yes. Thank you. Sorry. Anias Lin. Nin. Nin. Sorry. It's just a quote we have above our bathroom. <laughs> oh, for sure. Yeah, I'm taking a gap year this. So, am I planning on doing any more work like this? Uh, I'm taking a gap year this year, and I'm definitely going to go and hopefully go join the Mexico project. Dominica is its own nation or part of another nation? Yes, it's, a, it's, a, it's own nation. It's own nation. <coughs> Commonwealth of Dominica. I'm assuming through all your travels you experienced some culture shock, so I'm wondering like, what was the first kind of experience of culture shock when you went somewhere and then when you came back? You know, I was kind of surprised, so in Dominique, I didn't have much culture shock because I was staying with a bunch of other, actually, yes, 
I didn't realize that Thanksgiving was, all, like, obviously Thanksgiving is just the U.S. and Canada, but I didn't realize that, and we had Thanksgiving in Dominica, and it was some people's first Thanksgiving, and I was kind of shocked about it. I don't know why, but, uh, but I was really eased into the Dominican culture because I was staying on a base with a bunch of other foreigners who weren't Dominican. So I was kind of eased into that, so I didn't have too many, like, strong culture shocks. What about when you came back? When you came back? The first just obviously, the, the, the obvious one is that like, people cared about different things. And like the time, not the time difference, like time zones, but like people spend their time doing different things and also perceive time differently. Like in Dominica, time is so slow. Like everything is just so much slower. <coughs> Even working eight hours a day? Even working eight hours a day? Because the time is so much slower, right? Well, I was also working with 60 other volunteers who were from fast-paced cultures. And then when you were working with the locals, like if, uh, there was like a school project and a roofing project. And the roofing project was uh, you were with more locals. And it was definitely a lot slower. And you worked in different conditions. Yes, great. How did you stay on top of your school work and like your credits and managing that? <laughs> <laughs> So I was originally going to stay for a month, and I, that was going to be a little bit easier to keep on top of my schoolwork, but then I decided to stay for two months, and having only th like three weeks between going to Guatemala and going to Dominica, I just had to take unattended for some classes, and just spend, that's what, that's what I'm catching up on now, is after this, I'm probably going to spend a lot of time catching up on all my own work. Sean. So you spent two months in Dominica, and I think everyone who knows you knows that you have a giant heart. You're a very big fucking person. Um, so I saw that in Guatemala. Like, I guess my question is, do you think you did too much? Like, do you think you tried to do too much in terms of like going in really deep in Dominica, two months, and then going for a month in Guatemala? In the end, right now, are you feeling like? Well, that was an overload, or like that was. I'm glad I challenged myself to like go deeply in all these places. Um, yeah. So I take on too much. I mean, it was really rough for me to go to Guatemala right after Dominica. It was really hard for me to take in like the full experience of Guatemala because I was already so full and didn't have any time to like unload my experience. And I was talking with my mom last week and she was noticing things that I hadn't even noticed about myself yet. Like I, I still haven't unpacked this this experience yet because I've been gone all year and been traveling all year. I just got back three weeks ago and I've been focusing on this project. So, but I have no regrets. But don't spend three months during your senior year <laughs> out of the country. <laughs> Oof, why did I stay, stay, stay in Dominica for two months instead of one? Because it was coming close to my, on my seventh day in my journal, I kept a journal the whole two months I was there, I was like, oh, I don't want to leave. I wish I could just stay. And then when it got closer and closer, I was getting closer with all the people around me, like all the volunteers, and I got really close with Deborah's family. And the project was like, coming to super exciting park where we poured a 182,000 pound roof. And I was just like, I can't, I can't miss this stuff. Like, I got to stay another month and experience us like, handing off the school to the children. So I stayed so I could, because I got really close to people. Paul. Oh. Isn't that called a gap year that you just did? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's 